Money, they say, is the root of all evil. This has manifested in the life of Joe, a young orphan in Holland. Joe lost his parents to a fatal accident a few years ago. He was the first child of the family and had just one sibling. In other words, it was just him and his younger sister, Maria. Joe has always been an adventurous guy. He fantasized about the wildest things. Plus, he was a lover of luxurious and of luxurious and expensive items. He was ready to do anything to buy his dream clothes or shoes. He loved designers, which is not a bad idea. However, his parents were average citizens of Holland who left just a few properties for him and his sister. Joe's obsession and designers made him lose all possessions on shoes, bags, clothes, wristwatches, and necklaces. Joe has a girlfriend. Her name was Jessie. They were a bird of a feather that flocked together. She was in for all the expensive life. She admitted that she got attracted to Joe in the first place because of one of his designer wristwatches. All they do is rock the latest designers in clubs and attend parties. They drink in a stupor and ride each other home. They do the wildest things even as a teenager. Since there was no parent to caution or chastise them, they lived their lives to their fullest. The painful part was that of the poor Maria. She was just six, but in a real sense, wiser than her 16-year-old brother. She often advised her brother to save up his money to further his education in college instead of the unnecessary flamboyant life he was living with his girlfriend. Jesse never liked Maria, and Maria never pretended to be fond of her. Maria would go into her room or play with her street friends whenever Jesse was around, as she didn't want anything to do with her. She practically perceived her as a bad influence on her brother and couldn't afford to be influenced by her. Joe and his expensive girlfriend Jesse were out on one of their adventures on a fateful day. It was a gathering of rich kids. These guys were in a league far from Joe and his girl. These guys wore expensive clothes, and it wasn't difficult to notice them. Even the blind could easily sense that they were rich kids. Joe and Jesse felt intimidated and oppressed. Something unexpected happened. While everyone was enjoying the music and grooving to the buzz from the gigantic speakers, Joe and his girlfriend were active dancing like everyone else. In the midst of that, a young white guy approached them. The guy had an average height with a smooth face. He looked fresh and was sparkling in a deemed room. His smell gave a mixed feeling. He smelt like mint and berry simultaneously. As he approached them, Joe ignored his presence as he wrapped his hand around his girl to claim territory. But it seemed Jesse wasn't playing that. She stylishly took Joe's hands and stared at the other guy intently. The guy got closer and softly whispered into Jesse's right ear. Joe was lost at this moment. He couldn't grasp what was happening. Is this someone trying to throw advances at his girl in his presence? And his girl seems to be enjoying the whole moment. He immediately tried stopping whatever was happening, but his girl stopped him before he could say much. She advised him not to create a scene or constitute a nuisance as the gathering was filled with rich guys and they could do and undo things. He immediately calmed his nerves while he observed the whole moment play out. The white guy stretched forth his hand, opening his palm. He was asking Jesse out on a dance with him. Joe was surprised after he saw Jesse compliment the white guy's hand with hers. Like a dream, Jesse left with the other guy and winked at Joe, telling him she would be back shortly. That didn't sit well with Joe. He lost the whole vibes and mood to party as he dashed out of the dance hall. He headed home. He met Maria at home, playing with her toys. He stormed into his room, ignoring Maria. Maria quickly noticed something was wrong with her brother, so she joined him. She asked him what was wrong, but he was not going to tell. After much pressure from his sister, who didn't seem to take no for an answer, he slapped her and chased her out of his room. He pushed her through the stairs. She hit her head and sustained a head injury. After a few hours, Jesse was spotted at their gate. Maria, on sighting her, ran to the gate and told her to go away as her brother was done with her. While at that, Joe heard his sister is shouting at someone at the gate. He swiftly stood up from his bed and checked through his window, shifting his curtain to one side. He saw Jesse and ran outside immediately. 
he ordered Maria to go inside so he would throw her out of the house. He asked Jesse what she was doing in his home and asked her to go back to the guy he abandoned him for. Jesse begged that he allow her in so she could explain herself. After a lot of pleas and explanations, Joe forgave Jesse. The excuses were genuine to him. Besides, he loves her. Maria felt sad that the girl was back in her brother's life without stress. After the saga, Joe took it on to ask Jesse the valid reason behind her actions. She told him it was the guy's expensive designer wristwatch. She explained further that she had come across that particular wristwatch on Alibaba, which was newly launched. Joe wanted to satisfy his girl. He swore he was going to get the exact designer wristwatch for Jesse. Jesse, instead of being happy, had a nice laugh. Joe was curious and had to ask her why she was laughing. She opened up that the wristwatch was damn expensive and where the heck would Joe get the money? Joe sighed and bowed his head. He seemed to be thinking about how to get the money. After a deep thought, he suddenly shouted, Crowdfunding! The confused Jesse looked at him with distaste as she asked him what he meant by crowdfunding. Since you started following the rich guy, did you forget the meaning of crowdfunding? He asked ironically. Jesse explained that it wasn't the meaning, but she finds it difficult to draw the correlation between crowdfunding and getting a designer. Joe quickly chipped in his idea. He told Jesse that he would open a GoFundMe account and get people to donate money for him. What would be your reason for the donation then? Jesse asked him curiously. I need it to buy a designer for my girlfriend, of course. He replied innocently. Are you silly, Joe? No one would donate to such a cause. Joe was enlightened. At this point, Joe was confused and had gone blank of ideas. Jesse explained further that the people would only be compelled to donate when it has to do with sympathy. Jesse told Joe she had a better idea. Joe quickly asked her what the idea was. Jesse told him that they would need to get someone who was ill and open an account for the person. Joe told her doesn't have anyone who is sick around her. Jesse said they could make his sister, Maria, sick to achieve their aim. Joe said that's fine, since it will be a stunt. Jesse frowned and quickly told him they would have to make it real. Joe was confused again and asked several questions about what Jesse meant by making it real. Jesse calmed him down and told him it was not difficult. Since he detested his sister, how about they eliminate her? Joe was shocked. He didn't want to do this to his only sibling, but he loved Jesse and would do anything for her. He listened to Jesse. He asked her how they would go about it. Jesse promised to get a poison that would kill gradually. They would use the poison on him for several days, and hopefully by that time, they should have garnered enough money for their designers. They set out to execute their plot. Jesse gave Joe the poison she had promised. Joe injected the poison into Maria's chocolate. By the following day, she began feeling unease in her tummy. While she struggled in pain, her brother brought out his phone and recorded her. He used the video to gain the sympathy of the populace. The budget he set up to get his sick sister treated was $3,500. After three days, people supported and amassed almost $4,000. Joe, who couldn't contain his joy, quickly placed a call through to his girlfriend. He informed her about the new development. They were both happy they came up with the best idea. Joe felt it was time to call it to quit, but Jesse seemed to enjoy the play out. She told Joe they would have to continue if they could get that amount in just three days. What if they stepped up their game and went a week? Jesse advised that they strategized again. This time, Joe would do a video of himself appreciating the public for their kindness and praying for them, and at the end of the video, he should start crying and tell them that the doctor said they would need more funds to get his sister stable. Joe thought of it as a brilliant idea and thought of trying that out. Joe continued injecting Maria's chocolate and would continue for the next seven days. After the fifth day, they were able to amass over $10,000. Joe and Jesse were pleased. That was like a jackpot to them. Maria, on the other hand, was getting weak by the day. She kept complaining about tummy upset and pleaded that his brother should take him to the hospital, but he never listened. Maria spent her nights in pain. She was forced to take chocolate, the only thing she had throughout the day. She grew lean and sad, but her callous brother didn't seem to give concern. 
Joe and Jesse made a pre-order of the designers they wanted to get. Greed wouldn't let them stop quickly. They decided to continue crowdfunding. They knew Maria would die soon, so they quickly made another video of her. There was a drastic change between the new one and the first video. Maria was thinner and looked more helpless now. They used her negative change to their advantage. They told the populace she needed more money to be stable and back to her usual self. The budget this time was increased to $15,000. A police officer who had been following their story from scratch and donated his quota to the course became more interested after seeing the drastic change in Maria. He wondered if the doctors were to be blamed or the poor girl's family for not using the money for her treatment. He decided to look into the case. He hired one of his boys to help track the location where Joe stays. He located their apartment and went to them with no upfront notice. He knocked on the door. This was when Joe was about to inject Maria's chocolate for the sixth time. Jesse ran to the door to attend to the person who was knocking. The police officer walked in on Joe. At the sight of a uniformed man, Joe quickly hid his hands behind his back. As he was still holding the injection, the police officer noticed the unease in his countenance. He asked him to present his hands slowly, else he would have to use force on him. As he fidgeted, he presented his hands with the toxin and injections. The police officer curiously asked him what he was using them for. He stuttered for words. As he managed to say something, the voice of Maria interrupted. I'm dying, help me, she said quietly as she had lost her momentum. The police officer ran and found Maria where she was lying, looking helpless. He called in for support. He arrested Joe and his accomplice, Jesse. Maria was immediately rushed to the hospital. Her case was critical, but the doctors gave her first-hand attention. The police officer told them to make sure she didn't die. After a week, Maria improved while Joe and Jesse were sent to jail for their barbaric act. Maria was soon discharged. She was granted government support and scholarships. The money that was gotten from crowdfunding was also awarded to her. She had to take up the mantle of adulthood at a tender age. But she is an intelligent girl. She can deal. Life is full of mystery. The more you try to unfold it, the more you continue to realize there is more to it. Everything seems normal in this popular hotel in the city. People are coming in from every part of the world, as tonight is the night for the popular gala night. The hotel has been repainted purposely for this event. The color of the hall looks radiant as every staff seems to be working hard to ensure the event turns out to be better than the previous year. While everyone was busy getting prepared, a voice caught a young man's attention. It was an older woman. Excuse me, young man, can you help me cross to the other side? She asked politely. The young man, who looked like someone at the vent of losing an appointment or a dinner, reluctantly agreed to help her without asking further questions, as he forced a smile on his face. Day could not get any better, he said silently as he helped the older woman and walked away pretty fast as they got to the other side of the road, leading to the famous hotel. The woman gave a relieved sigh. At last, she said as she approached the door of the hotel with her crutches. An old woman, who should be in her 80s, was limping with her crutches, trying to get into the hotel. Judging by her mode of dressing and her look, what could she be looking for? She seemed to be a beggar or someone from a low-life family. This was the dialogue that transpired between two security officers who were on duty. Sorry, ma'am, but you can't go in, they said as she approached them. The older woman's countenance changed as she pleaded with the security officers to let her in. Unmoved by her words, they brushed her aside in a bid to let in their customers. The older woman could not hide her emotions anymore. Tears gathered around her eyes. I own this place, she quickly comments. The officers asked what she had just said, and she repeated herself. Security stares at her from head to toe scornfully, and one of them asks, Ma'am, would you kindly leave here before I call the cops? She cried out that she owned the hotel this time. She was very loud that she attracted the attention towards her director. People started to stop by and ask why the security officers are harassing an old woman on crutches. 
while some of the guests condemned the officer's cold attitude towards the older woman. Some praised them for doing their work diligently, as any beggar shouldn't be allowed into the same hotel where highly respectable personality exists. I would rate this hotel zero star and tell them how bad the hotel has become if this dejected woman is allowed here, an unknown voice amid the gathered crowd roared. He probably looks like a business person of high profile. As it is known that nothing flies as fast as wrong information, it flies faster than a rocket, making the situation noticeable to the hotel's owner. To appeal to the people about the problem, he comes out. He comes out only to find his grandmother at the center of the situation. He rushed towards her and gave her a big hug. Everyone was astonished, and there was total silence. It was as if a minute of silence was being observed for a loved one who had just departed. The security officers were as confused as the guests. Why is the CEO all out and embarrassing himself? Hugging that old wag is the height of it. The expression on the people's faces said it all. The CEO manages the situation by introducing his grandmother to all and orders that the security officers escort his grandma into the hotel for the gala night. She smiles as she approaches the door of the office. A lot has changed here, and I can see you are doing well to keep our family's legacy. After all these years, I'm super proud of you, Tony. Tony, the CEO, smiles with a questioning face as he offers his grandmother a glass of water. Come on, son. I know that look. I might be struggling health-wise, but you should know I will never miss the gala night again this year. It could be my last, you know, she said with worries on her face. But Tony moved closer to her to reassure her that she would not die anytime soon with a warm hug. Tony asked why she had to board a plane alone, risking her health. She told him she was trying to do anything that makes her happy, as happiness increases her lifespan, and to retake a glance at the hotel. They both have a good laugh. Grandma, I'm not impressed with what happened earlier. I should make some clarifications. Tony requested she stay in the hotel, as there were first-hand situations that he needed to address in front of their VIPs at the event. She said that was fine. She dipped her hands inside her bag to take her men. I shall wait here for you, son. Tony leaves for the office, but not after instructing the security officers to ensure his grandmother is fine and attend to her need. The older woman's eyes traveled around the room as she was impressed with Tony's development around the hotel. She was pleased with everything her eyes caught, and she knew even Tony's late father, who happens to your son would be proud of him. Tony returns to check on his grandma to be sure she's okay. He slightly opens the door and finds his grandma smiling. He chuckled and closed the door behind him. Tony knows the central question will be about the older woman he welcomed outside earlier. He is ready to face it and answer any questions in that direction. He climbs upstage to open the gala night as it is the hotel's custom. As he approaches the podium, a loud voice throws a question he has been expecting. Mr. Tony, who was that beggar you hugged outside? He smiled and requested that the guest remain calm as he explained everything. He gives his opening speech and welcomes He gives his opening speech and welcomes everyone who has honored their invitation. When he was done, he decided to talk about the older woman many had met earlier. So, many who care to know that was my grandmother and she is the owner of this hotel. The revelation caught so many by surprise that there was an indistinct murmuring in the hall. Mr. Tony decided it was time to let his grandma give her speech. He invites her especially to the podium in front of the special guests. As she approached the stage slowly with her crutches, she smiled brightly and stood in front. She could not help it as her emotions got the better of her. The number of the crowd moves her. Most people in the event become silent waiting patiently to hear from the older woman herself. She begins her story after wiping up the tears. I am Mrs. Williams, the owner of this beautiful hotel, which is managed and well supervised by my grandson. Everything in life comes with a price, and we have to face whatever life throws at us, she says, still maintaining her smiling face. I am very ambitious, 
and I always try to beat my husband's success because I strongly believe women can also be seen as equal to men. I think so much about quality. My orientation got the better of me as I slowly began to drift away from my family. I built this hotel and many other companies around the state, forgetting I am needed as a mother to my son and a wife to my husband. Because of my target, I decided not to give birth to another child. At first, my husband strongly opposed it, but he eventually came to terms with me because he is very understanding. Tony's father, who was my son then, hated me so much for the lack of attention and love. This is something I have grown to regret every day. He grew up well through my husband's help and the maid he preferred calling his mother. I didn't seem to care. That was the least of my worries, as I was too occupied with the work that I failed to realize my husband was battling a terminal disease. He kept it away from me to ensure I focused on my ambitions. I could not have been able to save his life, but I could have been there for him when he needed me. At this point, she was getting very curious. Tony immediately recognized the symptoms as her mental illness beginning to swing into act. He rushed towards her, calmed her down, and decided she had had enough for the night. The audience was silent as everyone was touched by her story. They ponder in their minds as they had many questions that needed answers. Did the terminal disease eventually kill her husband? What happened to her son? Mrs. Williams begged Tony to let her continue the story, as that would free her from the heavy burden within her. Tony seemed reluctant, but could not do much as the older woman looked determined. All right, but you know you also don't have to do this. She looked at him, patting his back, and made her way to the podium. As she tries to mount the podium, the curious audience starts clapping and is all ready to hear her story to the very last. I was in my office when I was called by the family doctor who broke the news of my husband being in a coma to me. On getting there, he explained the situation of things to me, which sounded like a lie to me. My husband looks healthy, I said to myself. She became emotional again. She recounts terrible. She cleans up her face and continues. Only then did I realize I had not seen him in a while. I rushed towards the ward and saw him on life support. My ambition ruled me, but I still loved my husband. And after months of looking after him in the hospital, and after months of looking after him in the hospital, and spending night with him right beside him, he passed away. My son accused me of being the reason for his death and vowed never to have anything to do with me. Months later, everything seemed odd due to the end of my husband, who was the source of my wisdom and achievement. On the other hand, my son graduated as a business management first-class student, began to do drugs, smoke, drink, and even be accused of being a rapist. He attempted to rape a young lady at that time. His condition worsened when he became an addict. I tried to talk him out of it and be there for him, but he never saw me as his mother. He was in rehab when I learned he had impregnated a lady. I took the young teen in and began to care for her, and she gave birth to my Tony. My son's condition at the rehab grew from worse to worse. As there was no improvement at all, he started falling ill at the rally again. We later discovered that he had been smuggling drugs with the help of a guard. His lungs gradually began to fail, and the drug damaged kidneys. He was released to come home after I pleaded for his release for better treatment. On his arrival home, he was furious about the baby and vowed to deal with the mother. I went out with my grandson, to whom I had promised to dedicate all my time, only to get a call that the house was on fire. The investigation later had it that the fire broke out after my son tried lighting his cigarette in the kitchen after trying to calm his nerves. The maid who was at the home at the time Tony's mother and my son all died in the fire outbreak, leaving just my grandson and me against the world. The shock resulted in depression for me and led to my current health condition. The audience feels so sorry about what the older woman had to endure. Her story seems to be a very tragic one. They also pitied Tony, who had never had the opportunity to see his parent. The older woman moves close to him, hugs him tight, and apologizes for taking his life from him. 
At this point, Tony could not control his tears as he held her close and sobbed into her shoulder. Everyone stood up and clapped as a sign of respect for them holding up strong. The old woman silently sighed and said, I can get to rest now when I... She smiled as she makes her way down the with Tony holding her right. The older woman's story so inspired many people at the gala that they were able to learn one or two lessons. Solemn music plays in the background as most people are left with the thought of not making the same mistake made by the all very costly like the older woman. I was driving my car, minding my business, much like I did every Sunday. There is a stretch of road not far from where I live, blasting down it at speed and watching the rolling hills and waves of leaves rush as my car tires hit them. Once upon a time, this was the highlight of my week. Now, it's just an awful memory and flashback that haunts me. One Sunday afternoon, I foolishly decided to take a different route that appealed to me. I took it, and looking back, I wish I hadn't. I went just a little, tiny bit too quickly, leading to me spinning out a little. It was also a damp day. The rain had finished pouring from the sky earlier that morning, soaking everything in sight, especially the road, which didn't help in my case. I wasn't as good of a driver as I had initially thought. Even worse was that on the other side of the road, there was an oncoming car, which I somehow managed to collide directly into. Unsurprisingly, the man driving the vehicle was unhappy, as his rather expensive and pristine Ferrari had just been violently dented by my crummy Ford Focus. Being a typical 17-year-old and growing up in southern England, I couldn't do much better, which, from the benefit of hindsight, was a good thing, as if I had been going any faster. I think I would have caused a lot more damage to my vehicle. The man wanted compensation, and he wanted it fast. Thousands and thousands were demanded, but I was far from able to pay, so he had resorted to his other, far worse for me, choice. He threatened to summon me to court to sort it out there. Seeing as I was too immature and poor to sort this matter out on my own, as he had put it. I knew that he could not legally do this, though, so I stood my ground, scared out of my mind, but undefeated. Nobody dares to me like that. I was more than ready to take him on until it clicked. I had barely any money and no experience, but I needed a skilled and professional lawyer. Despite the damage done, by my relatively small Ford Fiesta being minor, the man made a big deal out of it, and for all I knew, it could have escalated into me receiving criminal damage charges. I knew he had one of his friends to aid him, an experienced accident lawyer who could quickly and efficiently rip me to shreds at the click of a finger. And who did that leave me with? Nobody. But then again, I was more than used to this. An orphan like myself is an orphan for a reason, after all. The one thing I had going for me was a high-quality education, and although I knew almost nothing about my area's legal system, I knew that I was more than capable of learning the ins and outs before the court date had been told. Several weeks passed, and he continued to bug me, threatening me with court dates and his evidence folder and telling me he would wring my already struggling bank account dry. I was terrified of what was to come at first, but by this point I was unfazed, knowing that I had learned quite a bit about the legal system. The anxiety I now faced had kept me from leaving my house for weeks to come, like I was trapped out of my mind, as well as in it, so all that was left for me to do was study the traffic and accident laws of my area to increase my chances of success significantly. The anxiety began to fade as I read them over and over, taking down any notes that would help me, and then picking from them what would win this case. Now, all that was left 
was a little more procrastinating. Just a few more weeks left to find my inner lawyer, which was looking more and more likely by the second. I had always been my best friend, so seeing myself through this challenging time and coming out on top was likely. The victory was definitely in my sights. Despite all the stress of the case, I still needed to live an everyday life and maintain a standard of living. But everything was intense and complex. Even a simple trip to the shop led to a spike in anxiety. It was like everyone was looking at me, fixating as I strolled past frantically, trying to pick up my groceries while encountering as few people as possible. How did they even know that I was in a court case? What business was it to them? The day before the court case arrived, I received a phone call to confirm the details. They were surprised I would rather defend myself than have someone do it for me. Surely I would want a free lawyer. No, honestly I wouldn't. I wanted to prove that I could stand my ground and fight my battles despite my background. The sour and rich older man cackled when he was made aware that I was on my own, but that was his downfall. His wealth clouded his judgment and led to his subsequent humiliation. Before I knew it, the day of the court case arrived, and I was scared. Scared was an extreme understatement of my emotions. The man stood, towering over the podium that he was put upon. He must have been at least six foot five, maybe closer to seven feet. Now, it wasn't just his persona that intimidated me. This giant man would indeed have me beaten physically, but in the court, I was pretty confident he would lose to my knowledge. I was prepared and reminded myself of this as we headed into the court and sat at our respective tables, waiting for the judge to walk in. We stood up as he walked in, though I struggled to stand straight as my legs trembled beneath me and sat down as the case began. The judge presiding was a more prominent man, though he had quite the cruel face, and the jury didn't look much friendlier either. However, I would be fine, and by the end of it, they would surely be on my side, after all the convincing arguments I had prepared for this case. The experienced lawyer stood no chance against me now. I was in my prime now. We argued back and forth, but I was no longer scared. I was empowered. I could now see more clearly the cloud of fear had been lifted. Due to this, I noticed the uproar of the jury whenever he spoke. They were seemingly on my side. As their moods changed, the lawyer the other man had hired began to look less confident and more like he was about to piss himself off as he realized he was losing. Seeing this was like fuel to the burning fire of confidence inside of me, and several times I had to hold back a smile from creeping onto my face. At last, it was time. The jury began to file out of the room. One by one, they disappeared, and in thirty minutes they'd be back to tell me if I could have my life before or not. It was time for me to go on a break, too, while I waited, but first... I got to see the cracked caricature of the man, legs shaking and no eye contact made. He was nervous and doing a terrible job of hiding it from view. It was a sight I enjoyed immensely, very much, quite an amusing thing to see. It lifted my spirits as the anxiety I was feeling made me want to burst into tears, but the happiness helped me hold it back as we waited for recess. The minutes passed slowly. 1,800 seconds felt like 1,800,000. As the jury reconvened in the other room, I could feel my life slip past me. But when they returned, I sat up straighter, waiting anxiously for the verdict of this case. This would determine the rest of my life. I don't know how I could cope if I lost this trial. I waited with intensely bated breath for the judge to speak. His cruel face stared down at me, and he began to talk about my fate. After much debate, the jury and I have come to a mutual conclusion that the defendant is not guilty and that no fees must be paid for the accidental damage inflicted upon the Ferrari by the defendant's car. 
I had never thought I would win in a million years, but it was like a great weight had been lifted from my shoulders. I could finally relax after all this time, go out and see my friends without his army of followers harassing me wherever I went. The relief was utterly indescribable, and the joy after, as the judge told me that the man I had crashed into would have to pay me compensation for the damage instead. It was more significant than anything that I had ever felt before. He was all alone. The world seemed to be plotting against him. He was young mentally, but his body was frail and damaged. Nothing would get him out of this hellhole that he had gotten himself into, or so he thought. After his girlfriend dumped him, he reconsidered and told himself he was weak and puny. Every night, he'd beat himself up because he had the perfect girl and let her go. He knew no better. It was how his deceased mother raised him. The path to strength is admitting your weaknesses to evolve, my boy. He would even sometimes cry himself to sleep. His mother would have been ashamed. At 38, Dave needed to be self-sufficient and mature, but he still slept with a stuffed teddy bear and hadn't acknowledged the responsibilities of life. He hadn't even tried to, not once. Unfortunately, though, this pain wasn't needed. He didn't know this because he was too naive to realize that she was a gold digger and only loved him for his money. His mother certainly wasn't innocent, so who knows where Dave got this awful trait? Maybe his dad? Then again, the less said about him, the better. The question that Dave should have been asking is why didn't she stay if she wanted his money? He was so naive, after all, that it was an easy job for her, right? There was one minor complication she soon found out the hard way. He had no money. He did until his mother passed. All of her inheritance was donated to an animal charity without informing Dave. He could have bought a house with that money, but he was not entitled to it. The cats of Dover were more precious to his dear old mother. Following this relationship, Dave threw himself straight into a new one. What was life without a few risks? Have to keep moving. Days had passed, and he had concluded that it wasn't his fault. He was still unaware of the valid reason Beveldust blamed her mental health. He was ready to find someone new. He was confident that he had the charisma, looks, and humor to find his life's love. The only thing he was missing now was money, which was about to be fixed. Arriving at the door, he felt a weird and slightly ominous presence. It was like someone was intensely watching him. The front lawn was well presented, which immediately gave Dave a sense of comfort and warmth that combated the eerie presence. Walking in fairly calmly and composed, Dave introduced himself. Good afternoon, sir. I saw your advertisements in the paper. Some important details were missing, which worried me slightly. But what could go wrong? I want to be your new business partner if you allow me to have the honor. The same naivety that trapped David in an abusive relationship for four months had just trapped him in a shady agreement. How did he still not realize what was going on? A few months later, all seemed to be going well. They had set up a very reputable shop and had turned over a large amount of revenue. This had made David insanely happy, and he was looking forward to getting a cut of the quarterly profits and using them to invest in his little flat, get himself out of debt, and start living his best life. He walked up to the office door, confident and sharp. He knocked four times, as always, and waited, smiling to the brim. Thirty seconds or so passed, which was unusual, considering that his boss always answered almost immediately. He said that it was due to not being able to focus entirely due to certain things that he couldn't disclose. David knocked another four times, 
but no, there was no response. He couldn't even get into the building himself because he had never been given a key. Most business owners would get a key to their facility, but the locksmith can't replicate the key as of now. I'll keep trying. This was the excuse that kept being given, and yet again, due to David never batting an eye when details like these arose that didn't seem quite right, he would continue not to question a thing. Poor old Dave just wanted money. His quality of life depended on it. He knew the only way to get some was to find his boss and get his deserved cut of the corner shop revenue. He didn't spend nine hours a day selling Freddos for nothing. It wasn't fun. It was anguish, and without the money, it was an absolute waste of time. The following day, Dave marched to Mr. Baker's house and looked at the door. The pure despair and shock on his face were so prominent that they could have been measured with a tape measure. Sold. Mr. Baker's house lay barren in a wasteland of overgrown foliage. Dave quickly rang the estate agent to see if he could provide some updates. He sat on call and listened to the awful elevator music until, eventually, someone picked up. Hi, I'd like to find out what is going on with Mr. Baker. He's my business partner, and I am keen to find his whereabouts. I'm sorry, sir. I need more details. His first name and date of birth should be enough. I, I don't. Thank you for your time, sir. Enjoy your day. Even when defeated and distraught, Dave wished others to be well. Despite being scammed over and over and undermined by everyone who had the chance, he was still a kind-hearted and reputable man. Even in his darkest hour, he kept his integrity. Unfortunately, though, this sentiment didn't last too long. He was trying his best to keep it together, but eventually, the reality of what had just happened quickly caught up to him. His phone plummeted to the ground, and Dave fell onto his knees and started sobbing. The penny finally dropped. What a silly name Mr. Baker was to use as a work colleague. Why wouldn't his boss tell him his first name? Why didn't he get a key to his own business? So many other suspicious aspects are overlooked. Things took a further turn for the worse when another penny dropped in Dave's mind. His girlfriend had also pulled the same wool over his eyes. His boss and girlfriend wanted him to do things for them without witness or reward. Dave felt puny and helpless. He had no girlfriend, money, confidence, or life. He was a certified failure, and his one chance to redeem himself had failed due to his oblivious nature. Many months passed, and Dave was still struggling to cope. He had gotten himself a primary job working locally, but the small wage of this job barely covered his necessities. One morning in the autumn, he went for a stroll. The immense cold pierced through his delicate skin, and the rain began to pour. It reflected his poor mood, and the dampness in his eyes soon stopped due to the rain like when he found out that his boss had screwed him over with the business. Dave fell to his knees. But unlike last time, someone came to help. A silhouette shrouded in the autumn fog drew closer. A cute and soft voice emanated toward Dave, making him feel immediately better. You all right, mate? She was so pretty. Dave got back on his feet and introduced himself. It was like he had been given a new lease of life. The energy flowed within him, and enthusiasm ran through his veins. Jump forward a few months, and Dave had become engaged to his new, soon-to-be wife, Adriana. She was perfect for him, no more taking advantage of poor old Dave. She loved him for who he was, not what he had. He was sweet, generous, and caring, all that mattered to Adriana. Dave never heard back from the shady businessman that ripped him off. Part of him was sad that he wouldn't get the money that he had rightfully earned, but this was the part controlled by his brain. The territory controlled by his heart was enamored by what he had achieved and who he had fallen in love with. He had no money, but he had a life 
and a happy one at that. Emily had a very admirable job as a stockbroker, which meant they could move into a house together without financial issues. Adriana was often at work, which told that sometimes Dave got very lonely, but he would always wait eagerly for her arrival back home. It made his day, and the thoughts of his tragic past experiences were quickly washed away when he was with her. Dave and Emily went on to spend the rest of their lives with each other. They would eventually have three children, six grandchildren, and a great-grandchild before Emily sadly passed. Dave, although struck by immense grief, was happy in many ways that he got to spend a massive portion of his life with Emily. He dared not look at the past and opportunities he may have missed. He only looked back on the opportunities he rightfully took and benefited from. It was almost 3 p.m. The sun glared over the pier, and as the car pulled up, the tension swiftly began to rise. You don't have the money, you get out of my car, yelled the driver angrily. This was the third or fourth time he had dealt with this particular client, and he had reached a breaking point. A distressed but masculine voice could be heard from the back seat of the car. He desperately tried to explain to Pablo why he should still be helped. Pablo, I swear, I will find some way to pay you back when we get there. Please don't abandon me now, especially when we've already gotten this far. The end is in sight. Unfortunately, though, Pablo was already beyond the point of reasoning. Enough was enough. The passenger, Felipe, didn't have any money, so Pablo would do what he has always done with fare-dodging passengers for the past 15 years of his career. Kick them out wasn't remotely his responsibility. Pablo had kindly gotten him through the border and had also previously offered aid to Felipe and his family. Now it was time to cut ties loose. Felipe and his family, his wife Camila and their son Samuel stared blankly as Felipe drove off and accelerated long into the distance. They were now on American soil, but they owed Pablo $10,000, so they would have to continue the journey alone. The beach was lovely and picturesque, but fairly brisk due to the time of the year. Samuel started to get increasingly cold, so Camila wrapped him warm and positioned his wheelchair in a way that angled the warmer sea breeze toward him in an attempt to combat the cold. Talking to himself, he mumbled some thoughts. He didn't even realize that he was saying them aloud. I didn't like the idea from the beginning. If I'm honest, we should have tried to find a cure for him back in our own country. Sure would have saved a pile of money. Unfortunately for Felipe, Camila had heard his mumbling and wasn't particularly pleased about it. Contentiously, she reminded him for the 50th time that they had already tried the doctors back in Afghanistan. They were great and very kind, but didn't have the necessary facilities or treatments. However, they had heard that these treatments were readily available in America, which is why they had invested so much in going there. The sheer audacity of Felipe to brush this off and complain about the chance of their son recovering was out of order. Felipe, to nobody's surprise, was depressed about this and quickly retaliated. The cracks in their relationship promptly started to deepen due to the stresses of Samuel's illness. And look where we are now! We have no money and are stranded with our... <laughs> Raging. Felipe kicked Samuel's wheelchair which caused it to jolt him forward, causing immense pain. Camila, much like Pablo earlier, had reached a breaking point. She understood his anger and shared the sentiment in many ways. But taking this built-up rage out on their son, who was already suffering enough, no way in hell she would let that slide. A fight began to erupt, and sensing this tension, Samuel tried his best to calm his mother down. Don't answer him, Mom. Just leave it. But he hurt you, and I need to teach him a lesson. Nobody hurts my son. Mom, listen to me for once for crying out loud. Mom, listen. I hate it. I hate it when you two fight. It makes me feel even worse. So just, just stop. The next few days were tense. Felipe did his best to put aside the previous anger to find a place for the family to stay. 
After a few weeks, Felipe just about manages to get enough money to rent out a small room slash attic in a nearby town. Settling in was proving difficult, but it would have to work somehow. To try and be comfortable, Samuel lies down on some cardboard and sits with his mum, staring blankly at the rotting ceiling. Felipe would have customarily joined in with this, but his anger was still circulating within him. You never failed to keep my spirits up, but I think it would be best if I meet my end. We have tried everything feasibly possible, and continuing this endeavor is tearing you and Dad apart. I don't want to be remembered as the cause of your divorce, not after 22 years of happy marriage before I came along and ruined it when I was born. Don't you dare say that again. This is a country of peace and prosperity. There's no corruption and very kind-hearted and good people live here. The medicine, doctors, everything. I am 110% sure that we will find help for you. When have we ever let you down? Deep down, she didn't want him to answer that and meant it to be rhetorical. Camila and Felipe had let Samuel down so often that it was hard to keep count these days. Before he could reply, Felipe interjected, infuriated by Samuel's comments. He never wanted to hear this again. He was determined not to give up. He had gotten into debt and traveled half across the world for nothing. He loved his son and would do anything for him. Stop feeding him these lies, Camila. He's a grown-up already and understands the situation as clearly as day. We are both in the wrong, and as much as I hate to admit I am wrong... Our son's life is at stake. Let's be realistic and sort this out, okay? You're a good father, Felipe. We all know that. We are a strong family, just cracked and in need of repair. I think Samuel's recovery is the perfect repair. Please, don't give up. We are close to our goal. Another long time passed, and they had finally reached a doctor's surgery. There was hope, at last, that Samuel would get better. The doctor and Camila talk for a while, but forget that Samuel is in the room. He overhears, and it upsets him because they speak depressingly. I understand your situation. We can make some discounts for you, but you have no insurance. I have already slashed the cost of the treatment in half, but I don't know if it will be enough. Two hundred dollars is the absolute best I can do. I'm doing the best that I can to help. Can I please see your documents? Camila began to cry. I don't have any documents. The doctor looks and sighs. Look, I've been as upfront as possible with you. Maybe come back when you have located your documents. Little did he realize that they would have to travel hundreds of miles to find them. Camila continued to cry. Her luck had honestly run out. Mom, don't cry. We shouldn't have come here. I will die here anyway. Now we have no money, no family at all. It's all because of me. Dad was right after all. It was a rainy and bitter New Year's Eve. The night sky was starless and dim, which wasn't typical for the area. After making a stop at a local gas station, Pablo was on a drive when he pulled into a hotel to pick up a predetermined passenger. No name was given, just the address and the time. In all the years that Pablo had been cabbing, this had never happened before, and it was very suspicious to him. A silhouette got into the car, and Pablo began to drive. A faint but familiar voice pierced through Pablo's soul. He had never expected to hear this voice again. You killed my son. He looked around. It was Felipe in the back of the taxi. His face was crumpled but tense. You, you bastard. You kicked us out of the taxi at the border. We had no chance but to seek out the closest doctor, and he couldn't save him. If you had driven us a bit further, my boy would be here today. Pablo was equally angry. He had no intention of killing Samuel and was upset by the news. Unfortunately, Felipe was too far gone to acknowledge this or care. He had it in his head that Pablo had killed him, and now the $10,000 he owed him was the least of his problems. Felipe wasn't necessarily known for being violent, 
but he could do all sorts when he was pushed. He had known Pablo for over a decade and considered him a dear friend. A dear friend of the past, though. He could not forgive him for what he had done and could not live with himself if he let Pablo live. You killed my son, and now he's gone. My life is dead and my wife has left me. Even if she blames you, our revenge was the last thing we agreed on. You will never see that ten thousand dollars we owe you. You will never see the light of day again. End of the road, Pablo. Wasn't friendly knowing you.